all take our hymn books this morning and turn to page one. And let's all stand as we sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, page one. turn this down or I'm going to blow them out. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone this morning. Just do a few announcements as we start this morning. Um, the Circle of Hope this afternoon from 2.30 to 4 is inviting you to a housewarming shower for the Love Chatham House. Please come and enjoy refreshments, fellowship, and help us provide some much needed items, and that'll be in the fellowship hall. And then April 29th, Forever Young will meet at the church at five to go out to eat. 55 or older, you can come join them for fun and fellowship. And on April 30th, reminder of fifth Sunday breakfast during Sunday school, bring your favorite homemade breakfast to share. Any other announcements we need to bring up at this? Yes, ma'am. Cemetery Board of Directors at 4 o'clock yes. out back? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Circle of Hope meets at 6 o'clock. Meets at 6 o'clock. Okay, not 7 o'clock. Okay. And there's copies of the newsletter. Right. Newsletter. Right. Copies of the newsletter are back there on the table. Any other announcements? Okay, uh, time of praise or prayer requests, ones from the Sunday School Hour are Jamie Gilliland, Shirley Lindley, Charles Fuquay, Nelson Bowers, Archie Culberson, Glenn Culberson, and Nancy Murchison. Any others you would like to add? Yes, ma'am. And when does he go? Okay, so Phil will be going for tests sometime later in the month, okay? Any others? All right, if you'll stand, we'll go to open in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for a time to come 
bear each other's burdens, to support each other through the difficulties of life. We know, Lord, that you've already won the victory for us. We thank you that you go before us, you prepare a way, and you have a plan for our good. We know, Lord, we can trust in you. We pray for each one that's been listed. Facing physical challenges, Lord, we pray you'd give their doctors wisdom, that you'd comfort their families, that you'd heal them according to your perfect will. Pray you'd go with us through this service. We would, everything we do would be for your honor and glory and to build up each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymn books and one more time and turn to page five. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. book of Proverbs has a lot of wisdom. I thought we might read a few verses here uh, together as we continue in our worship and uh, as we enter time of open worship after the choir sings, maybe this would give us something to reflect on uh, if we're interested in that. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through 7, he says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. See, I think there's a difference there. Let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. Wonderful words of wisdom about our heart this morning. We're going to have a choir special and then a period of open worship.
When I was a young pastor, I started off preaching, and I was preaching every week, and started really when I was 22, my first church, and uh, even in college, you know, I'd preach here and I'd preach there. Well, when I got to a church, one of the things I did in college is, you know, if you preached about something once and you liked it, you know, you could preach about it again several weeks later at a different church, but make it better. And uh, when I got to the church, I realized I couldn't do that. If I preached it once and I preached it again several weeks later, but better, people would still know that I remember doing that. And I thought, uh-oh, I better, I better do different things every week. And, but I was at one church for 13 years. And uh, several years into my time there, I kept picking more obscure passages, you know, which I love. I'd dive deep and we'd do some in the Minor Prophets and... They said, well, pastor, what do you have against some of the the great stories of the Bible? I said, I don't have anything. I said, I preached about that four years ago. Where were you? (laughs) And they said, well, maybe I was gone that day or maybe we got some new people in the church. And it kind of struck me. Repeating things isn't altogether bad. And, and, And really sometimes when you go through a story one direction and you go through it maybe several years later, You can pick up different things looking at the same story because you're in a different part of life. One of the things that I catch myself doing after Easter every year, and I've done it for a while, and I just do it personally, and I have talked about it on various occasions, I've used this message, but I think it's so important, is Easter didn't hit everybody the same way. Uh, The two ladies on Easter Sunday rushed to the empty tomb followed by a couple of the disciples. Not all the disciples. There were disciples that didn't rush to the tomb that day. There were disciples when it talks about Jesus meeting up with the eleven, it says that Jesus saw them. And it doesn't say, we know doubting Thomas. It doesn't say one doubted. You know what it says about the disciples who were with Jesus for several years and then saw him crucified? Actually, most of them didn't see him. They were gone by then. It says some doubted. They saw resurrected Jesus face to face and they were like, I just don't know. What in the world? It's interesting. And so when I go through these passages of Scripture and I read kind of at the end of that and you see Doubtus and and less Doubting Thomas... Unless I put my hand, unless I see, right? Then, then I, and, and some of us are like that. Um, there's one person who had a much worse experience, I think, than most of the rest of them. He abandoned Jesus after he told him he wouldn't. And then Jesus actually had to go through a restoration process, and that's with Peter. And I want to go through the story, and I want to hit some highlights. We're going to end up in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, but I want to start off the story where we do... And I want to call it, I found this wonderful graphic, and I thought, well, let's use that. Peter gave up. And so before you give up, let's look at the life of Peter and see what he did after the cross. So this is before the cross, Matthew chapter 26. Peter and the other disciples are around. Jesus says, listen, the next few days are going to be rough, guys. And uh, they're going to take me away. And Jesus (coughs) quotes a scripture. I brought water up here. Here we go. Jesus quotes a scripture that says, when they attack the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And so he tells the disciples, all of you are going to abandon me. And what does Peter say? Not me. How many of you all know what it's like to say not me, and then it is you? (laughs) I'll raise both hands. Peter says, listen, Jesus. He gives Jesus a lecture. I don't think giving Jesus a lecture is the best way to start a conversation. All of these other yahoos, forgive me, I'm paraphrasing, they might leave you, but you may not remember, Jesus, I'm Peter. I'm not going to leave you. I'll never fall away. And so Jesus says to him, truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, even if I die with you, I'll not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. So you have Jesus quoting something, a prophecy. It's going to (laughs) happen. And you have Peter going, eh, 
just because you're Jesus and just because you're quoting prophecies, <laughs> you may not know me that well, God. And he says, I'm going to hang with you no matter what happens. And, and so they're, they're going about, you know, Jesus is arrested. You know, Peter had his sword cut off the ear, guy's ear and he's all ready for the battle, right? But they get in and stuff starts getting real. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to verse 69 of the same chapter. Peter's sitting outside in the courtyard, the trial's going on, and there's kind of a mob mentality, right? If one person's on trial and you see somebody who connected to you, like, oh, that person, aren't you with him? Now, when you're the guy getting ready to go to your death, how many of you want to say, I'm with that guy? Right? It's not your first instinct. We have an instinct as human beings called self-preservation, right? Fight or flight, and we're either going to fight to protect ourselves or we're going to flee. <laughs> We're going to do something, but we don't want to put ourselves in harm's way. It's one of those things about us. And so Peter, as strong as he was, now notice the difference here. Who came up to him and said, you were also with Jesus the Galilean? Of all the people who put G Peter on the defensive, who did it? It wasn't the chairman of the army. It wasn't the head of all the centurions. It wasn't a strong dude. He's there and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you till the end. By later that night, a little girl walks up to him and says, gee, I think I saw you hanging out with him. And what does he say? I don't know what you're talking about. And then he relocates. <laughs> so he says, okay, he's going to go out to the entrance, right? He's hanging out in the courtyard. He's going to say, well, I need to get a little further away from the action. Another servant girl saw him. It's interesting to me how strong we think we are when we're doing things on our own. And when it comes down to it, something on the scale of, right, the things that should be intimidating to Peter... The servant girl would not normally qualify, but she asks this great question again, and she says, wait a minute, this guy was with Jesus of Nazareth. This time he denies it, but with an oath, right? I swear that I don't know this man, right? That's what it means. And Jesus had already said, don't swear yes or don't swear no. You let your yes be known, you know what I mean? So, Jesus, you know, Peter is stepping out, but he's saying that even more. And it says, after a little while, some by bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you're one of them. Your accent betrays you. What are they saying? We know you're not from around here. You must be with that guy. And, and so, you know, the, the, they're going on and on. And so this is the third denial. And he it says he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. Now, if, if swearing is bad enough, add swearing to a curse. Now, see, here's where it's even awkward for me because there are things in our language that are abusive and that are, are said in the wrong way and then we consider those uh, not, not acceptable for public use. And there are times when we're allowed to put the words together and I feel compelled to, to, to say them and even spell them instead of saying them out loud just because I don't want to accidentally mess up, right? But what we think is he might be say, well, may God D-A-M in me if I'm one of those people. I'm not, right? That's what he's saying. He began to swear a curse on himself. May God, you know, con condemn me is what he's saying if I know the person. And then he swears I do not know the person. So first he says, I don't know what you're talking about. He moves further away. The next time he adds the, 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 the uh, swearing and then the next time he adds the swearing and the cursing. That's all within 24 hours. Poor Peter thought militarily, right? I got my sword. I'm going to cut that guy's ears off. I'm ready for battle. The spiritual battle, he wasn't ready for. The standing up to evil, he wasn't ready for. All of these other things. And so he was tripped up by the least significant things. And not only did he deny him, but it got progressively worse. Progressively worse. The passage of scripture then says, and immediately the rooster crowed. Have you ever been in a situation where you did something wrong and your conscience is like that rooster crowing? How many of you in the morning you're, you're sleeping and you're getting those nice last few minutes? How many of y'all live next to a rooster and the rooster crows? And what is it? It's just a violent waking up, right? It's rude. Roosters are not friendly people unless you want to hear them, you know, cock a doodle doo, and most time it's early in the morning you don't. How many of y'all just love to hear a rooster wake you up? Some of you. I'm not talking to you. 
to everyone else in here, right? That rooster crowing is kind of annoying, right? You don't want to hear the rooster crow. Do you think Peter, when that rooster crowed, he thought, oh man, that's great. What did he think? He knew instantly. It dawned on him. His conscience may well have been yelling at him. Oh, that's right. And I tell you, it's interesting because if you go back and read, I've had to skip around a little, Matthew 26. The story of Matthew and the story of Jesus and that are, are laid on top of each other. In Matthew 26, it'll tell the story of Jesus and Peter, Jesus and Peter, Jesus and Peter. And they're side by side, as the Bible often does, it gives us two ways to handle something. We have Jesus losing his life for our sake and finding it through resurrection. We have Peter trying his best to save his life and losing his reputation, right? Because of how he handled the situation. And I would say if we have two options, which one is, is supposed to be put up, right? I think the option we're supposed to choose is be more like Jesus, not be more like Peter. And yet if we identify with one a little more than the other, I'd say a lot of days I feel a whole lot more like Peter than I do like Jesus. I feel like the one who said, God, I can handle that, send it my way. And after it knocked me down and spun me over three times, I said, okay, God, what can I do to get ready the next time, <laughs> Right? But before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times, he remembers the words of Jesus. And it says, he went out and he wept bitterly. I can't imagine what Peter's going through. What's interesting to me, if you read out the rest of Matthew 26, we don't hear about Peter. If you read the rest of Matthew, the gospel, we don't, leave, we don't hear much about Peter. Can you imagine during those days, there's a gospel written about you and it goes around to all the churches and that's the last they hear about you? That's embarrassing. You're the guy who promised up and down you weren't going to leave Jesus, and when it came down to it, you left him like the others. Only worse, because he said you would deny him, and you did it, and even the rooster witnessed it. Right? I don't think he went to that grave that Sunday morning. I think he went somewhere else. I think he thought, this is the end. I left it's time to give up. For us to learn anything more about them, we've got to hop Gospels over to the Gospel of John. John wants to tell us the rest of it because John knows the point of Easter is not telling us that, G that uh, Peter fell out. It's that Jesus didn't, but it's also that Jesus, the reason for that was restoration and redemption. So we pick up in John chapter 21, and they're out doing some things, and Jesus is appearing, and he's going back and forth. And Simon Peter's waking up. This is after Easter, after Jesus is walking around, after he appears to them. And Jesus, Simon Peter, says to them, probably the other disciples, I'm going fishing. It's an interesting statement because what was Peter before he was a disciple of Jesus? He's a fisherman. Fishing for fish. And Jesus walked along one day and saw him and several others out there and they were fishing and he thought, man, these would be good fishers to men. So he says, follow me. They lay down their nets, they follow them. He says, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And that all worked out really well until the betrayal of, of Peter. And after that, what did Peter do? He went back to fishing for fish. I believe Peter gave up. I believe Peter thought Jesus would never have another use for him. I believe Peter said, this is too hard, and it's embarrassing, and I don't like it, and I'm done with it. I like fish. They don't talk back. I like fish. I don't have to worry about it. Sometimes I catch them. Sometimes I don't. It doesn't matter. I'm going fishing. And it's interesting because the disciples said what? We'll go with you. Peter was a natural leader. So either Peter was going to lead people to follow Jesus, or when he quit, he might have been leading people to quit. Either way, they all go out, and so they get into the boat, and that night they catch nothing. Now there's an interesting part of the story, we can't cover it all, but, but they go out, and, and uh, Jesus shows up, and he says, hey, how are y'all catching some things? And, and uh, jumping ahead just a couple of verses, it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved... Uh, that's John referring to John's self. Now just let's stop for a minute. How many of you love to respond to yourself when you're, when you're writing about yourself and say, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved? 
John didn't say, I, John, saw, or I, John, said. He said, the disciple Jesus loved. I, I, by the way, I'd like to formally, from here on out, be referred to as the pastor who Jesus loved. <laughs> the husband who Jesus loved. The father who Jesus loved. Whatever I'm doing at the moment, I want to be the one that Jesus loved. I want to be so convinced of the love of God for me that I, that I just go around referring to myself in the third person. Uh, as the one who Jesus loved. Peter didn't have that. Peter didn't have that. So they're in the boat. Everybody knows Peter's struggling. I bet everybody knew Peter stuck his foot in his mouth again because they knew Peter. And so the disciple that Jesus loved said, when they heard the voice at the side calling out, how are you doing? They said, it's the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. It's an interesting picture. They're out in the boat. Peter thinks he's done, I think. Peter's thinking in his mind about what would it be like to get another boat and go back out and fish for a living. Jesus is probably done with me. And then he hears Jesus is there. He's so excited that Jesus would come by, that he's sitting there and he's got his, his, his loincloth and all of that on, he's grabbing his outer garment, it says he threw himself into the sea. I think he's so excited that there might be redemption and restoration that he at least wants to be in the vicinity if it was going to happen, right? So we skip ahead a little bit. The, the disciple, Jesus tells them to go out, cast again. They're going to find all these fish. Peter's not helping them anymore. He's gone to shore. He's going to see Jesus and the Bible gives us a little clue as to what's coming. Now, Jesus was in the grave three days, Jonah in the belly, belly of the well for three days, or whatever the fish was. And then in verse 14 of chapter 21, as the story is untold, the disciple who Jesus loved thought it to, important to tell us that this is the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I think it's just a little clue that the number three is going to be important. And so they're all eating breakfast. Jesus cooks them some fish. And, and I don't usually eat fish for breakfast, but I bet, imagine those fishermen did. And, and so they eat, and Jesus is there. And everybody's probably wondering, right? You ever heard of the idea of the elephant in the room, right? If you try not to think about one thing, try to picture an elephant in the room, and what are you going to think about? I can say all day, don't think about the elephant. What are you going to think about? Once I said elephant in the room, you're going to think about the elephant, all right? The elephant in the room is Peter denied Jesus three times. Here's Jesus, here's Peter, and I bet everybody was looking for some fireworks. I bet everybody had talked about it. What do you think's going to happen? Peter went back fishing. Did you hear Peter went back fishing? I heard Peter went back fishing. I heard he caught nothing. <laughs> I bet God's trying to tell him something. Well, then Jesus comes up and said, fish again. They catch how many? 153, whatever the number is. Fish, it may have been 138. I don't remember the exact number. And, and all of a sudden, they're catching something, and they say, all right, let's see what's going to happen. Is Jesus going to fuss at them? What's he going to do? And after they finish breakfast, it, it doesn't tell us that all these people aren't around. And if the disciple that Jesus loved is sitting there, he wrote all of this. He had to have been there, right? So all of these people are around and they're waiting to see, Jesus, what are you going to do with Simon? And so he just asks them this question, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I always thought it was important, what does these categorize? Is it the other disciples or is it the fish or is it the... The, the stuff, the boat, the, the fish. He said, hey, do you love me more, Jesus said, than everything else? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then you need to feed my lambs. Right? Which is the shepherd kind of, of scenario. So he asks a second time. How many of you, you think it's necessary to ask a question you just asked? I've had people do that, and I think, well, you must not have believed my first answer because I already answered that question. But Jesus asks again, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. The number three is important, right? In verse 17, it says that he sent to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time. Why is Peter grieved? Is it because of the third question? Or was it because that's a reminder of the third denial? 
I think he's reminded that Jesus knew exactly how many times he denied him. And so however many times he denied him, Jesus meets him in that place. I think one of the great things about Jesus as leader is that Jesus wasn't afraid to have difficult conversations if it meant restoration. I think sometimes, and I'll speak for myself alone, sometimes I don't want to have a difficult conversation. Sometimes I'll put it off a day, right? But Jesus just faced it. Do you love me? Finally, Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And Jesus kept talking. He said, truly, truly, I tell you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and and walk wherever you wanted. And when you're old, you're going to stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. I think that's a very fascinating verse of Scripture. But it said this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after that he said to him, follow me. So I think the story is about self-sacrifice. And then we get back to this model of uh, uh, um, uh, restoration and redemption that God is trying to bring back Peter, but he has to go through a situation. This is what I think it looks like. Peter's fishing. Then Jesus says, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Everything's going great until what? He denied him three times. Now you might think Jesus would be the one to just go out and say, hey Peter, you can still follow me. But he doesn't do it that way. There's got to be a process of restoration. When we fall short, right, Jesus could come back and kind of erase all of that stuff. I don't think it's so helpful to do that. It's, it's almost like we've got a lot of dust and to get rid of the dust, we lift up the rug and we sweep it under the rug and we forget about it until later. We lower the rug back down. That doesn't really take care of anything. It doesn't really heal anything. It doesn't really accomplish the restoration in that way, right? If you have a vehicle and there's rust on it, I've tried this before, I was young and I had a car with some rust on it. What did I do? I went to the store. I saw this product called Rust-Oleum. I painted over the rust. What happened? The rust didn't go away. To restore, what do we need to do? How about clean out the rust? How about accept what the problem was in the first place, handle the problem, and then bring it out, right? So that we're healing, we're providing, we're taking care of, and then we're restoring. We're getting that stuff out. And so what Jesus chose to get rid of, to meet him where he was at the three denials, is the three questions. I think it was Jesus' way of showing, however much you're willing to go in the other direction, if you'll turn back to me, I'll come that far to get you. I'll go as far as you need. I wonder if Peter said... Jesus would have forgiven me if I denied him once, but I don't know about twice. Or Jesus would forgive me if I denied him twice, but didn't swear, but then I swore, so I just don't know. But what I do know is that Jesus wouldn't forgive me for denying him three times and swearing and cursing all at once. I think that was the weeping bitterly. I think that was the going back fishing. And I think Jesus said, not only will I forgive this and this, but I'll keep forgiving. Jesus told us to forgive seven times seven. How can we think he's not going to do it for us? But I want you to see something else. There's another pattern in there. When we read the Bible in English, we, we're, we're tempted to overlook this. There's two words uh, predominantly in the, in the Greek uh, Bible for the word love. We use one word to talk about any number of things. And it's the word love. And love can mean two teenagers decide they're in love, right? It can mean uh, 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 somebody who's older but has a sibling and they love that sibling. It can mean a, a carnal kind of love, a passionate, that we could call lust. It can mean all kinds of things. But in the Greek, they, they have a distinguishing uh, word for different kinds of love. One of those is brotherly love, phileo, and it's the city of brotherly love is what? Philadelphia, okay? So that means I have a brother and I love my brother. It's different than the way I love my wife. It's a different kind of love. I have a fondness for them. I'm not going to treat them the way that I would a spouse or something else, okay? And then you have the kind of love that the Bible talks about when it says God so loved the world that he came, brought his only son to forgive us of our sins so that we might not perish, right? 
And that's a different one, and that's the sacrificial love, and that's a much deeper love than the, than the brotherly love. And, and so I want to reread this passage of Scripture using the words that they use, and I set it up here so it'll be crystal clear and you can read along. Jesus goes up to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me with a sacrificial love? Peter doesn't answer back with that word. Peter says, Jesus, you know I'm kind of fond of you. I love you with a lo brotherly love. Hmm. Jesus thinks about it a minute, right? And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with a sacrificial love? What does Peter say again? Jesus, you know I'm fond of you. Why do you keep asking? Well, Peter, probably Jesus is asking because you keep using the, not the word he's using, right? And the last time, Jesus doesn't use that word anymore. He doesn't say, Peter, do you love me with a sacrificial love? Because Peter's not there. Peter's, Peter's not at the place to sacrifice. He wouldn't give up his life. He thought he would. He just fell short. And so Jesus said, well, do you even love me with a brotherly love? That's when it grieved Peter. Because Jesus wasn't holding the high standard anymore. But he lowered that standard to pick Peter up where Peter was. And Peter says, yeah, you know that I love you with that brotherly love. Peter never used the word for sacrificial love. And that's why it's interesting where Jesus says, wait a minute. <laughs> when you were young, you used to take care of yourself, do whatever you wanted to do. When you get a little older, and I think this is spiritually, not physically, although there's an analogy, he said, you're going you're gonna to stretch out your hands and somebody else is going to have to dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. I think the analogy is there. To say, when you're young, you get to do what you want to do. But when you're a shepherd of my sheep, he said, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. you got to go where the sheep are. They're going to lead you around and you're going to have to sacrifice for them. Now, he was saying, God, I want to love you with a, with a brotherly love that we'll go hang out, we'll watch, a, we'll watch a football game or a basketball game and we're going to hang out after work and we're going to do some great things together. That's a great kind of love. What Jesus said is, Peter, if I want you to shepherd my flock, you've got to get beyond that, and you've got to be willing to sacrifice for others, or you're going to make a pretty bad shepherd. So let's look at it this way. I'm, I'm a shepherd of the sheep. I wake up in the morning, I say, what do I want to do today? Well, the sheep went that way. I don't get to decide where I want to go. Where, where do I go? I go where the sheep went. I'm going to be led around. I don't get to decide. And so what he's trying to do for Peter is say, listen, Peter, I've already said, upon this rock I'll build my church. But the difference between me and you is between the word we use for love. And if you still use the let's hang out and I have a fondness for you love, it's not going to get anywhere. But if you're going to love me and take care of my sheep, you're going to have to start using this other word that is a sacrificial word for love. Right? It's deeper. It's more than that. It's I love you and I'm willing to sacrifice me for the best of you. That's the love that Jesus talked about in John 3.16. That's the love that took Jesus to the cross. The other love is what took Peter away from the cross. And he said, if you're going to feed my sheep and do all of those things, and then right at the end he said, wait a minute, because he's talking to him about, about that, Right? After that, he said, follow me. Follow me. So there's the restoration, the denial three times, the question three times. I think it's better to restore than paper over our problems. I think it's better to heal and handle issues and, and get over it than it is just to, to shove things under the rug. Peter, John, uh, 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 Jesus was willing to do that. And I think to follow the example we do. But I think when we understand what led Jesus to the cross, it might mean that we have to use different language and different thoughts about who we are if we walk into this room and we say, I love you. But what we mean is, I have a fondness for you. All right, there's an interesting passage and in, uh, Jesus says, you've heard it said, uh, love, your, uh, love your neighbor uh, and hate your enemy, but I say love your neighbor and love your enemy. Remember that passage? You're never going to have a fondness or brotherly love for your enemy. Jesus isn't saying, I need you to go over and hug your enemy. 
But what I think he is saying is calling us to a higher love of I'm willing to sacrifice for people I don't necessarily have fond feelings for. And so for Peter, if you look at it, and Peter, listen, Peter is the preaching hero of Acts chapter 2. He is the preaching hero of Pentecost. Peter preached one of the first sermons under the power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 people joined the church in one day. Peter went through a lot from Jesus' crucifixion until Pentecost, right? And, and this was his Easter morning because he didn't go to the tomb and look for the empty. This is where he found his resurrection several days later probably, right? Because Jesus had been popping up and doing that. But once he did and the Spirit got a hold of him and he was willing to sacrifice and do the things that he needed to do, Peter was one of the founding people of the church. If you trace all of the popes back, for, in the Catholic Church, they'll say they trace this pope to this pope to this pope. They go back to Peter. They go back to Peter as the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. And I'm like, wait a minute, the same Peter who went fishing? It's because of that restoration he was able to do. I'll argue this. We can go and we can look at Acts chapter 2. We can look at the first uh, sermon that Peter preached. It's a wonderful thing, wonderful start to the church. I don't think Peter is ever the preaching hero of the first church. Right? And of Pentecost and of all of those things without meeting Jesus and having this conversation. And I'll go back to a turning point. If we run from God, if we quit, right? Before you give up, if we give up, how far do I have to go? We're on our boat. And we hear that God has come looking for us. I think there's two reactions we can make. How many of you, maybe you don't even have to raise your hand, but for a period of time you ran from God. You hid. You didn't come to church. You went and did your own thing, and then God came knocking. He didn't come knocking on your boat. He came knocking on your heart, right? We've got two opportunities when we hear that God is knocking. One of them is we can hide deeper in the boat. <laughs> Peter took a slightly different take. When he heard that Jesus was there, what did he do? He threw himself into the water. Grabbed what he needed and threw himself towards God. If we think about running, if things didn't work out, we see everybody happy singing on Easter, and that's not necessarily our story because we weren't at the tomb. We didn't see the empty tomb. I was fishing. I was running for a little while. Maybe my Easter several days later, right? But Jesus, if you were once on his side and you start running, I believe Jesus is going to come looking for you. I believe no matter how far you run, it's a bad sermon for people who are in church. I should preach it to people who are out of church, but they're not here to listen to my sermon. No matter how far you run, Jesus will run further to get you. Right? But I think when that happens and we hear him knocking on the door and we know he's near, what if we just jumped in the water? What if we just opened our eyes back to God? Okay, God, I've heard you. I, maybe this restoration's not going to be easy. Right? Maybe it's going to be uncomfortable. Maybe I'm going to weep even more going back to God. But the restoration is worth it. And the restoration has a cost. If it didn't, it wouldn't be worth it. But Jesus is willing to meet you where you are. Right? And help you get back on the road. And I believe it's the people who went through a lot that God uses the most. Peter, I don't believe would be the preaching hero of Pentecost if it wasn't for this story. What about Paul? Right? If we look at all of the heroes of the Bible, which one were, were, had the best uh, situation? They weren't. They were a series of misfits that God took and used for the kingdom. They were people who failed, right? And God says it's okay to fail, but keep heading in the right direction. So let's be the kind of people that when God comes back to us, we jump in the water. But I think there's a, a, a lesson for a lot of us in this room. When we think of love, we think of feelings. When God says love, he means sacrifice. How many of us are willing to sacrifice for others? God said, right, Jesus quoted it, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That means for God so much loved the world that he was willing to sacrifice for it, that he sent his only begotten son but then God calls us to be like Christ, to be Christians. And I believe we're to be people of sacrificial love, not just fond feelings. 
And I believe there's a lesson for us. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, no matter what lesson is here for us, if we're running from you to be able to jump out of the boat and, and work back to you, throw ourselves into the water to be restored. Maybe it's to sit and let you work in our heart this restoration. Maybe it's just to know no matter how far we run, you, you want to find us and redeem us and restore us. Even Peter who denied you while you were on the cross, you restored and worked for your kingdom. Or maybe today we just need a lesson about love being sacrificial, not self-serving. Whatever the lesson from the Scripture is, Lord, help us to know that Easter was nothing if not about restoration and redemption. We need to be a redeemed people, seeing people redeemed. We need to be, a rest as a church, we need to be a restored people, looking out for the restoration of other people. Lord, you have given us the ministry of reconciliation. Help us to be reconcilers, bringing people back to you. Well, we pray for all of these things to come true in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, to bring redemption to our own hearts. We bless him, we pray through him, and together as God's people we say, Amen. We're dismissed.